Hello, I'm Cajora Suarez Orozco. I'm one of the co-founders of Reimagining Migration, and I'm also the director of the Immigration Initiative at Harvard. So today I would like to talk with you about what I have come to over the last 30 years or so of working in this field to think of as the most important things I think folks should know uh, if they are going to be working with immigrant origin children. Just who is the immigrant origin child? So let's start. So what do I mean by the immigrant, by children of immigrants? So they are, they, as the name would suggest, they share immigrant parents. They have a parent who is an immigrant. So they can be either second generation, meaning the child was born in the new country, in the host country, uh, and their parent uh, was born abroad, or they can be first generation, meaning that both the child and the parents were born abroad. So if you put together these two groups, first and second generation uh, young people that share immigrant parents, that currently makes up 27% of our children in schools today in the United States. They are the fastest growing sector of the child population. And, uh, is, and that has been true now for the last few decades. In 1970, they made up just 6% of uh, our children. And as I said, now make up 27% and they're projected to make up about uh, one in three kids uh, by 2050. So the vast majority of these kids are citizen children. Um, and, uh, uh, and so let's delve into a little bit more detail. They come from many different countries of origin. Uh, every country in the world is represented in amongst our immigrant young people, of course, some countries more than others, uh, sharing borders with us, sharing histories of colonialization, for example. Um, these young people are extraordinarily racially and ethnically diverse. Most come from Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Latin America. And as such, uh, they uh, are viewed as uh, people of color as they arrive in their new land. Uh, they're visible minorities, so to speak, and then must deal with the issue of being so-called perpetual foreigners. Um, so we're well on our way of becoming a majority minority country, but as we know, power and wealth are not evenly distributed, and there's a tension in the transition that we're facing. So how else are these uh, young people highly diverse? They speak many different languages at home. Spanish is the most commonly uh, spoken home language, uh, but every other language uh, imaginable is, is uh, found in public schools and big school districts like New York or LA, of course, we're numbering into the hundreds of languages, uh, but even in small districts, increasingly you're finding 10, 15, 20, even 35 languages. Um, the population is also highly uh, socioeconomically diverse. Their parents represent both ends of the spectrum from uh, amongst the most educated uh, folk in our country. Uh, doctors and, and, uh, and, and many entrepreneurs are, um, are, uh, come from immigrant origins, uh, but also uh, amongst our least educated. Uh, and that has implications for how young people adjust. Um, they're also represented in all sorts of work sectors. The parents are working in a variety of work set sectors. And we are finding that immigrants are, uh, are rejuvenating some of our traditional school uh, churches like the Catholic church and the, and the Pentecostal churches, um, as well as uh, mosques and, um, and, and uh, uh, churches across uh, and, and, play, and spaces of uh, faith across the country. So since they're so highly diverse, what are some of the common denominators of experience? How can we even begin to talk about a phenomena like children of immigrants? What, what might they have in common? So let's talk about some of those shared experiences. Well, 
in some ways, when I've described uh, immigrant young people and, and they're either uh, what they uh, live through, I've had people come back and say, well, tell me how they're different from other marginalized populations that I serve in schools. And that is true in some ways. They do share many features with other uh, marginalized student populations. They have a higher, they experience a higher than uh, uh, average uh, or the below average, I would, should say, um, socioeconomic status and higher levels of poverty. Um, their parents' educational and work conditions, their parents' education is lower often than the norm uh, in the new space that they're living and their work conditions are much uh, poorer and uh, less predictable. And then, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, since most are uh, visible minorities, they're experiencing racialization um, in the new spaces. But then there are, I would arguably, many different features to the immigrant experience that is quite unique. So, for example, while not all immigrants need to learn a new language, uh, many, and if not most, do. Um, and there is always a transitional phase um, and uh, both opportunities and challenges in that process, which is another talk. Uh, but, but certainly language acquisition, a second or third language acquisition is always part of the process of, almost always is part of the process of the immigrant experience. Then there is the uh, contending with being a newcomer and all of the accompanying social emotional challenges that comes with that, the losses, some gains, uh, but uh, the, the disorientation. Um, par immigrant parents all do and uh, have do and continue to uh, deal with uh, these issues and that has a trickle effect in the family. And for newcomer kids, they of course are going through it themselves. Um, they're dealing with not only the, the ongoing issues around and, and uh, social challenges around racialization, but also a growing climate of xenophobia uh, in, in uh, the US and also in many other uh, countries, of course, but certainly that where they're experiencing is here. And then, uh, and for about 25% of immigrant kids, uh, issues around undocumented status, not necessarily their own, uh, although in some cases that's true, but uh, their family's undocumented status has real implications uh, for their well being. So we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So, uh, what else are some features of the immigration uh, experience? Well, certainly stress is one of those. Um, that's a state of emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. I don't think I really have to uh, define that for y'all, um, but it certainly, uh, it, it taxes the system. It initiates a kind of fight or flight response, and it triggers a complex reaction of neurologic and endocrinologic uh, systems um, that uh, tax uh, the family and the person. Um, all right, so let's talk, let's talk now more specifically about uh, some of the, a more ex, uh, the most extreme version of stress, and that's trauma. And, uh, and this happens at several different phases in the immigration voyage. Uh, there's the pre-migratory trauma. Not all immigrants have a pre-migratory trauma, but that's often at the root of what initiates the migratory vo voyage. Um, not in every case, but certainly in many, and certainly something to be explored. Then for particularly uh, refugees and undocumented uh, folks, two different categories, by the way, but uh, each share the likelihood of a... Uh, a daunting, complex, and often highly traumatic uh, voyage. And then once they arrive, um, the traumas don't stop, the difficulties don't stop. Of course, like everybody else in post the pandemic or during the pandemic and, and in this uh, semi post pandemic phase, uh, they, are, they had to face the traumas that came with that, but then there's so many added layers. Um, including fears of losing their loved ones due to deportation. So we know 
uh, from ongoing work uh, with children that chronic childhood stress has deep implications for uh, long-term physical well-being, uh, but also immediate uh, learning capacities and the capacity for young people to focus in school, for example, or attend to uh, the most immediate need, anything beyond the most immediate uh, needs. There's a shutdown response that comes with that. And this is a form of trauma or a form of stress that is often not considered within the stress and, and, and um, the stress literature that, that most folks are exposed to. So this is a, a checklist of the typical adverse childhood stress, so-called ACEs, uh, that uh, is often accounted for or, or considered in assessments. And we see that a missing around that are issues of separation, death and loss, which is a frequent uh, event in uh, immigrant young people's lives, uh, particularly those who have undergone difficult uh, voyages. Uh, another level of um, that is very unique for immigrant origin families is the issue of uh, family separations. So family separations can happen at many different stages. It can happen uh, before the migration uh, begins uh, for the child. Uh, the child can be left with caretakers, with aunts and uncles or grandparents, while the parents make the journey, try to establish themselves, and then send, send for their children. It can also happen during the voyage itself. Children are separated from the parents, sometimes unintentionally, uh, during the voyage, uh, in accidents that may happen, or uh, by, in, as we see in this picture, uh, by law enforcement. And then there are uh, my separations that happen uh, post-migration when, uh, for example, family members are deported. And uh, we know from the literature, from research, that uh, these family separations are are normative. There were children, family, immigrant families are more likely to be separated from one another than not at some point during the immigration process. In a study I did with 400 immigrant young people from Mexico, from Haiti, Central America, China, and the Dominican Republic, we found that more than 75% of the families uh, had been separated from their children or separated from their children from anywhere from two to seven years. So this is a, a very typical of uh, migration. Sometimes the migrations are highly prolonged. And although the reunification is longed for uh, by all parties, especially the parents, but often also the children, the reunifications themselves we know are quite complicated. It's not like the families come together and it's all a smooth process. Often they have to get to know one another and there are deep resentments um, and uh, losses that have to be mended along the way. Another form of, of stress that immigrants, young people and families go through is what we, we psychologists call the culturation shock. It's all about learning the lay of the new land, things like the language, as I mentioned earlier, but also cultural practices. Little things like uh, how close do you stand to someone? How loud should your voice be? How late or early should you be to a meeting? And it goes on and on and on. All sorts of little habits, cultural habits that we never think about if we're only um, acculturated to one, enculturated to one. Um, but if you are coming to a new space, you have to learn those new rules. And they're not always clear. Um, and the gaps at times can be quite large. Uh, then there are family acculturated gaps. The kids typically acculturate much more quickly than the parents. Um, uh, the parents are uh, more likely to want to hold on to the ways of their own culture or their, their first culture. Um, and uh, the kids are uh, exposed more. As, you know, they're going to school six, seven, eight hours a day. And um, they're getting really, uh, they're getting a, bathed in the new culture, whereas parents often working, are often working in um, same ethnic, uh, co-ethnic workspaces. So they may not be 
exposed that much uh, to the ways of the new land. And so the kids learn more quickly and they want to become uh, recognized and appreciated by their peers. And so they're ready to let go um, and the parents are holding on. So that can create um, tensions in the family as folks adjust to one another. Um, or not adjust to one another so much, uh, you, the expectations are adjusted. Who's going to bend the most? Uh, and uh, how do they come, to, how do the parents and the children kind of come to an agreement on what works? And sometimes the bending happens most on the children's side, and sometimes the parents are willing to meet them part of the way. And sometimes the process is smooth, often it's not. Then there are issues around language acquisition and loss. And I think the loss should be underlined. Um, the children and, or, or families need to be learning uh, at least another, one other language besides their home language. Sometimes it's multiple language. So, so many folks coming from Central America and parts of Mexico uh, speak an indigenous language. And they are, uh, they need to, uh, they go to, a, they then learn Spanish and then they need to learn English. Uh, folks from China uh, often speak uh, a dialect of some kind uh, in, from, in their, from their area they're from, and then they, they need to learn Mandarin. Uh, and then they may arrive to the States and they may be put in a Cantonese bilingual program but, uh, on their way to learning English. Um, so there are multiple languages involved. Uh, we know that learning uh, for children in particular, learning English conversation doesn't take that long uh, with some good exposure, but uh, academic English, getting to academic English, that takes you know anywhere from four to seven years of quality instruction to get to a point where kids can be, comp uh, kids who are born abroad can be competitive with their native born, born peers on things like writing an essay or taking a multiple choice test. And then sadly along the way, the native language often atrophies. And while some folks might think that's not a great loss, in fact, it really is. It has tremendous uh, costs for family communication and intimacy. Uh, how deep can you go if you're only speaking about uh, pass the salt for, or uh, I need a new pair of academic, of, of uh, athletic shoes, or I want you uh, to do your homework right now. If the conversation is all in those terms and one person's, the parent is speaking one language, the kid is speaking another, not great for intimacy. Um, it's not good uh, to lose the native language, it's not good for ethnic identity. Uh, and, and kind of main, maintaining a sense of pride in uh, one's background, one cannot, uh, lose sight of uh, one's own culture uh, and feel good about oneself uh, through the course of life. Um, and, you know, and then of course, uh, we know that lots of, uh, of uh, folks from upper middle class uh, American society is making sure that their kid gets bilingual education or gets exposure to dual language classes so that their children have the um, the economic advantage of being bilingual. Um, and we, um, and so that's, and, and you know, why, how, why should we lose that language advantage that the kids already come with? Uh, but if you, it's a use it or lose it situation and uh, native language begins to atrophy um, and unless they use it all the time, are exposed to good models of use, uh, read, write, etc. cetera. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, so another challenge for immigrant children is uh, the notion of uh, social belonging, social be and, and social exclusion. So let me start by reminding you all about why social belonging is so essential. It's, a, it's defined as the human need to be part of social groups. We all as human beings ask ourselves, do we belong in the group? And uh, and it's a it's a, it's going back to Maslow 101. It's it's right in the center of the period pyramid of self actualization. And how do you know? How do we even know if we belong in the group? We know uh, based on everyday social encounters and experiences and social interactions. What kind of messages are being given to us about who we are and how we fit in? 
The opposite, of course, of social belonging and inclusion is social exclusion. And that's the process in which individuals or people are systematically blocked from or denied full access to rights, opportunities, and resources that are normally available to members of a different, often more privileged group. Social exclusion can take two forms or multiple forms really, but the, the one big category is structural violence. And that's, that means really uh, a jargony phrase for systematically being denied access, equal access to things like employment opportunities, housing opportunities, services that include medical services, educational opportunities and credit. And then there's a, a, a whole other more amorphous, more difficult to touch, but you know it when you see it. Uh, and that's kind of a social, the social violence of, of everyday uh, interactions that I alluded to earlier. That's the process of being otherized, of being tokenized, to being reduced to stereotypes, to being ignored and, being, and, and feeling invisible. These are everyday feelings that people get over the course of their interactions with, people, with others that give them a sense of, do I belong or do I not belong? And as I remind you, it's an essential piece of every human's experience to need to belong in order to feel well and to, you know, to be self-actualized. So do immigrant kids even know, oh, you know, you know, do they feel included or not? Is, are they aware of social exclusion or and social exclusion focused on immigrants, which is xenophobia? So to get a sense of that, in our study of 400 immigrant young people coming from so many different countries, we asked them to finish just simple sentence. Most Americans think we are, and if they were Mexican, they would say most Americans, we would say most Americans think uh, Mexicans are, and then the child would be asked to fill in the blank, or most Americans think we are, Dominicans are, if they were Dominican, et cetera. So this was a sentence completion task. The, the modal word, the word that came up most often was the word bad. And fully 65% of our sample had negative associations, worrisomely. So let me give you a taste of what some of those looked like, sounded like. Uh, most Americans think we are stupid from a 10 year old Haitian girl. Most Americans think we can't do the same things as them in school or at work, a 10 year old Mexican girl. Most Americans think we are garbage, a 14 year old Dominican boy. Most Americans think we are members of gangs, a nine year old Central American girl. Most Americans think we don't exist, a 12 year old Mexican boy. Most Americans think we are lazy gangsters, drug addicts that only come to take their jobs away, a 14 year old Mexican boy. So sadly, they're intensely aware. Uh, and uh, we did this sentence completion test every year over five years and the responses really did not change. This was how young people were perceiving their, uh, their views, uh, the Americans' views about them. So, you know, what are the implications for that? Well, it had implications for, um, you know, it wasn't the, the, all of the explanation for these trajectories of, of performance, but it certainly had uh, a partial explanation for these trajectories of performance. So we asked young people, oh, we, we, look, we collected grades and achievement tests from students over the course of five years. And what we found is that while 24% of the young people uh, were high performers from the beginning of the study across the five years, um, nearly 50% uh, or more than 50%, I should say, declined, declined over the course of five years. About 24% uh, um, were declined kind of at a slow rate and a little bit what you'd expect uh, in that transition from middle school to high school. But 27% declined precipitously, going from being B students to being C minus students. And then fortunately, we saw about 11% of the students start out as C students and make their way up to, to being a, a high B. So uh, the point is that most declined and, um, and, uh, and, and the, you know, this, that feeling they, they belonged uh, had a kind of wore out, wore on them over the course of time. 
Uh, now, I've, I've talked a lot about the challenges of immigrant young people, and I don't want to just leave you on that. I'd like you to also uh, consider the many, many resiliences of immigrant origin students. There's lots to build on. They're wonderful young people with lots of potential. Uh, and that's what we need to, uh, we, we need to recognize the challenges but we, so that we can remove as many obstacles as possible. And we want to uh, scaffold on their resiliencies uh, to help them flourish. So uh, one of the things uh, we, we can appreciate about our immigrant young people are their positive values. We talk to teachers all the time and they often say that these young, young these kids are really polite and work hard and uh, are more focused than their peers, are collaborative. Um, but, you know, and that's, that's great qualitative uh, data. Uh, but what are some of the, let's talk, let's, I always like to talk to the kids themselves. So one thing we did was we did a study of 65 uh, first and second generation young people, and we asked them to, um, to, to, we gave them a list of values and we asked them, what four values do you most associate with your country of origin? What four values do you most associate with the United States? And what four values are most important to you? And you know, not surprisingly, we found that most of them, they, they thought independence, pursuit of wealth, freedom and opportunity were the values most associated with the United States. Um, and then when they talked about their parents, there was somewhat difference. Independence remained important, but issues like family obligations, religion, faith, and spirituality, and helping and serving others were also high on the list. Family obligations being at the very top of the list, 75%, religion, faith, and spirituality, 50%, uh, and helping and serving others also quite high. But by the time we got to the young people themselves, when we asked about their values, independence remained high. Uh, but the sense of family obligations was also very high, less high than their parents, but still quite high. Religion and spirituality, completely gone. Uh, but helping and serving others was a value that was extremely important to them, as well as respect, probably because they didn't always feel it. They also have lots of uh, bilingual advantage, advantages. We have increasing evidence that uh, there are, that being bilingual has real social emotional advantages um, around things like cognitive flexibility and the ability to uh, take perspective. Is this a duck or is it a rabbit? Uh, is it two people facing one another or is it a chalice, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, real workplace advantages, and then, of course, the, the importance of maintaining speaking, continue to speak well, speak with your family. But being bilingual uh, is a terrific advantage. In fact, I just saw a study that says it's an advantage even for uh, protecting against uh, uh, Alzheimer's. So um, an advantage that most come in with. Um, and yet, so in spite of all these advantages, uh, we find that they're entering settings, uh, it's settings that aren't always so well prepared to serve them. Uh, many educators only have a very surface understanding of the immigrant child experience. Uh, many of them think of immigrant children simply as English learners uh, and don't always take a whole child approach uh, to, uh, to their experience. Um, and, uh, you know, they're not always able to nurture educational settings uh, that are conducive to optimizing learning, that uh, allow kids to reflect about their cultural experiences, that allow them to foster connection across differences, and uh, to manage difficult conversations. So, you know, the question is, at to, while educational settings are at the front line, how well are they equipped to uh, serve them? And there's great variation. And that's what we're here to try to address. So uh, the, the question moving forward is really who are the young people we are educating? Here in this video, we talked about some of the key issues immigrant origin students are facing, but we of course uh, need to consider their non-immigrant student peers who are sharing classrooms with them. To what degree are they hostile, oblivious, or, or allies to their 
uh, their immigrant origin peers? Do they know about them? Do they not, do they, have they noticed them? If they have, are they stepping up to be allies or are they actively hostile? Um, and then when they see something, are they bystanders or do, are they equipped to become upstanders for their peers, their newcomer peers? We know that our society is, face, is, is, um, is projecting all sorts of exclusionary social messages. Um, we know that, the, the, you know, my data sort of show, doesn't sort of, does show uh, that it, kids are really quite uh, aware of the cascading social messages on media and social media um, that is uh, out there. Uh, we see a big incidence of anti-immigrant bullying over the last five years and growing incivility in classrooms in, and in hallways. So as, as we look at this child who's holding the American flag, you can substitute any host country flag, but let's think of her as arriving to the US. All of immigrant children are anxious to become members of their new society as this little girl shows us with her drawing. They also must be able to be proud of their own heritage origins, I would argue. It is our task as educators to help them through the transitional process and to recognize that this is a temporarily stressful process. The majority of these children are resilient and with the right scaffolding, smart programs and welcoming attitudes will become proud and contributing members of their new societies. It is the ethically and morally right thing to do to, to help them in this transition as it was not their decision and they're simply caught in the tides of political, economic, social and parental upheavals. Further, given the huge numbers involved, it is a societal demographic imperative to see that they make the, these transitions to the new society, are able to flourish, to become civically engaged and to acquire the skills and competencies for the labor market for their new societies. Every child has the right to flourish and reach their potential. And given the sheer numbers, their futures will surely have a significant implication for, future, for the future health of our nation. Thank you, and I hope that you find this helpful.